next decade. Because LSSD is covering so much of the sky and it's covering it so fast at time scales that we really haven't done before on that scale, there is a significant potential for discovery of things that we just are not even thinking about. You can ask pretty much any astronomer, uh, you know, what's your favorite area of astrophysics and, and or what will LSST do for that area of astrophysics? And there's almost always an immediate answer. So yeah, LSST is awesome. So thanks. Uh, this, uh, that film is, of course, due to our outstanding communications and education team. So let's thank them once again. For Okay, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm Steve Kahn. I'm the LSST director. Um, this is our ninth LSST project and community workshop. Uh, it's one of the largest we've ever had. I think it may be slightly, uh, slightly smaller, a few individuals less than last year, but it's, it's great to see the tremendous attendance from people working on the project and also from scientists involved in the collaborations in the community to come together once a year and allow us to spend the week together in a nice resort location and interact in, a, in an informal way. Um, we have over 300 attendees from all over the world, actually from six continents, from uh, Australia, Africa, Asia, Europe, and of course North and South America. Nobody from Antarctica, but we have some people who've been to Antarctica, so maybe that counts as well. Um, it's a very full agenda. It'll be a, a fun week. I hope uh, as many of you as possible get to stay with us for, for most of the time. The agenda is the result of your contributions. We didn't try to micromanage this too much. It's all the suggestions that came in from the community, from the project, of things people wanted to talk about, issues they wanted to hear about, uh, and that's what's resulted in the program that you see. And there'll be lots of fun activities uh, as well as the week ensues. Um, I do want to make one comment about meeting code of conduct. Um, we've been paying more attention to these issues over the last few years. It's been true of most scientific meetings. Um, we want these, these meetings to be an inclusive, collaborative environment uh, that respects the diversity of uh, the individuals that have come together for this project and contribute their best effort. So we know that scientists like to argue and various different things, but be kind, trust one another, be respectful and inclusive, and hopefully this will be one of the best meetings that you've ever attended in your life. Uh, for those of you who are interested in our formal code of conduct, you can find it on the LSST 2019 work, work uh, space, work page, web page. And in that context, I just want to make uh, one other introductory comment about workplace culture generally. Uh, those of you who've been with the program for a while know that we had an ombuds program. Uh, and the individuals you see the top four at the, at the top, Sandrine Thomas, Richard Dubois, Chuck Kessner, and Andy Connolly, have been our ombuds people. We're evolving this program. Uh, it, it will now be called the Workplace Culture Program. We are adding additional advocates, for example, Carol Chirino from down in Chile, um, and we're trying to sharpen the reach and objectives. I won't say a lot about this now, but you'll be hearing more about this program as we go on into the next month or so. So that's all I wanted to say in the way of introduction. I'm going to turn over the, uh, the podium at this stage to Victor Krabendam, who I think most of you know is our project manager, and he's going to give you an update on the status of the project. Victor. Okay, good afternoon. As uh, Steve said, um, I'm Victor Kraubendam. There's probably a few people I haven't met before. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy that you're all here, and I'm hoping for a really great week. Uh, to get things going, I have a whole ton of slides to get through to really just inspire everybody to go onto the webpage to download these slides and look at them more carefully. 
um, and then to just stay engaged on any of the things that, that you see pop up and they'll go by really fast uh, because there's no time to talk about all the great things happening. Uh, but I really wanted to just tickle your fancy and get you to talk to each other about some of the great things that are happening and some of the challenges that we're still facing. So here's our agenda for the afternoon. Uh, for the next 40 minutes, 39, um, I'm going to go through these slides and then we're going to hear something about uh, some of the operations uh, planning activity. And then we're going to hear from some of the students that are here uh, that have done some summer work on LSST type project, science projects and they've got posters as well to go uh, to, to introduce. So if you're new to the de desert at this time of year, I would like you to really go look at these slides and read these carefully because this is a really great time to be in Tucson, but only if you follow our guidance about staying hydrated and being careful for a few different uh, kinds of activities like animal life and lightning and so forth. Uh, so please do take, uh, take a good look at that, especially if you're a new or not a frequent visitor to the desert in the summer. Also, um, we're going to be using lots of different spaces in this hotel. Uh, I really would urge you to know where you are and to know where your exits are. If you're in this particular room, straight out the back. Uh, there's multiple out exits, but you want to go straight that way because there's also exits of the building. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of kind of natural things that make you force, that force you to leave, uh, but it's still good to know where you are and how to get out. We have a packed agenda, as Steve already mentioned. It looks a lot like this. Uh, I also will once again encourage you to stay in touch with that. There's lots of posters out there. There's lots of ways for you to understand what's going on in the day. In particular, we've already made a change. Um, if you look on Wednesday afternoon, the poster session for Wednesday has been canceled. And so the only way you'd know that is if you were looking at the um, agenda as it evolves uh, throughout the week. Want to shout out to the 17 local organizers. You can tell them by the LOC on their bluish badge. Uh, you can also tell them by their, by their smiling faces here. Uh, there's, these people have put an awful lot of energy into making this successful. Um, and that goes into a lots of details. And I really want to thank all of them uh, for all of that hard work. Uh, that's, thank you. There's also nine people that spent the last several months trying to engage the community to understand what we should be doing this week. Um, and I want to also recognize the program organizing committee for their work in setting up the topics and the basic agenda and the, and the, the basic uh, structure of the, of, the, of the meeting. As well, there's a science organizing committee um, and they really focused on the community side of things, what topics are, are good for a project and community workshop and what kind of topics should we be engaged in or their interest as we go forward. So uh, in addition to all of the pre-arrangements that have been made by the group, uh, they're also putting a lot of time and making themselves very available. And so look for the Slack channel, the Slack hashtag for getting a discussion going or asking for help. Rampal has offered up her personal, well, her, her business email. Um, to, uh, to be in touch and is uh, very engaged in any of that communication will help with any problems um, that you don't um, uh, find someone to help you with. And then some of the kinds of details, you've already recognized that there are no power cords in this particular room. And so these are the kinds of things you're gonna wanna stay in touch with uh, as, the work goes, as the week goes forward. Um, and the other thing is that the resource desks and uh, Aaron and the travel desk, they're not gonna be there the whole time. So you want, if you have needs or you have questions, look to see what their schedule is uh, for when they will be around and they'll be happy to help you. Um, and last comment about anybody running a, 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 one of the breakouts is you've got to organize that room. You've got to manage it. You've got to make sure that we're uploading materials onto the website uh, because if, especially if you've got anybody engaging in the discussion from uh, afar that isn't going to be in the room, uh, you really have to manage it and, and work it uh, so that you can have a successful uh, discussion. So here's just a quick review. This, this is the resource desk schedule. You can see it posted on the actual uh, desk. Erin has offered up uh, her schedule. Again, she's here to help with all the logis any logistics for coming and going. Uh, and so feel, feel free to engage her on any of those questions. And now some sort of highlights of some of the items for the week. Uh, today, right following this plenary, uh, stick around because the students that are going to introduce their topics 
are going to be out front by the, or in the lobby area uh, with uh, their posters. And so please stick around and, and talk to them about what, what they've been up to and how that really might uh, extend into LSST going forward. Um, note that on Tuesday, tomorrow, 5.30 sharp, with your t-shirt on by the pool for the photo. This is important. Um, this is the only way we know that you are here. <clears throat> Not really, but okay. Um, tomorrow is also the reception, and so that's if weather, last year we had to hold it indoors, but hopefully the weather holds, and then we'll be uh, just down the way uh, for th that reception. And the point of that for today is if you're bringing a guest, please let somebody at the registration desk know so that you can get them registered and paid for. Unconference on Wednesday, this was a successful last year, uh, but these, these parts of the meeting are only successful if you come with your ideas. And so all week long, you have the opportunity to put a, stick it, a little post-it note, stick, sticky note on there. Uh, so you get people thinking about, and we can start to generate the ideas uh, to make that part of the meeting also successful. And we can address some of the near-term, sort of the, the, the pop-up kind of uh, issues and questions that come up. Lots of that video that you saw, some of the, some of the sort of uh, very uh, same format, close-up videos of people, was from the story time domain activity last year. And once again, this year, the communications group has set up to do that again. And so sign up for a time on Wednesday to go be interviewed and to talk about this year. It's, uh, the, the prompt is, tell us about something recent, uh, a recent win, uh, something that's particularly uh, uh, hopefully it was a win with the project, but maybe not. Maybe it was just a win in your personal life. That's okay, too. <clears throat> and then, but you do need to sign up for a time, and so look, look for that uh, opportunity on Wednesday. Thursday night at 7 is another public talk. This is something that we've done for the last several years. Uh, locally, the Tucson community is actually very engaged in astronomy, and there's lots of people that have a, uh, a direct interest, but also lots of people that are just affiliated and, and have a, a, a scientific interest. Um, and we've pulled in some significant crowds in the past. Uh, so please come engage with uh, the, uh, the local community, but also just to, to talk and talk about your piece of the project. Uh, well, there's a good, I'll be there to do this same kind of thing, and we'll hear some science. But there's always really cool questions that come up. Um, and some of them just are from, from left field uh, and will be kind of amusing. Um, but it's also fun to have people from the project in the room to answer them directly. Uh, so come if you can. Uh, the special note for Friday is uh, lunches on the go uh, for Friday after the plenary, but, and the rooms are still available all afternoon. If during the week you have some time, you set up some more, some more meetings, uh, that's fine, but local staff will not be available to support you. And so if you want to do that, talk to one of the local staff and we'll figure out how to, how to arrange it. You've already gotten your swag for this year. Uh, if you registered, if you didn't register, don't run out now, but it's at the registration desk. Um, but the team is always interested in feedback. So not only is there feedback about the meeting and how it worked and topics and so forth, but feedback on uh, some of the, uh, the things that we put out there is also, um, also appreciated. And lastly, for general announcements, um, Speakers, you've got to be, as I've already mentioned, uh, you've got to be prepared um, and upload, particularly for the plenaries. And for the plenaries, we're recording, and those recordings will be uh, available on the YouTube channel. There's also going to be mark your calendars, skip schedule the really cool stuff to do for the 4th of October this year, as that will be the next day in the life. And we'll want pictures from across the project on all the things that are going on. And so that'll be another opportunity. Lots of the pictures that were also in that video came from that uh, input as well. And then uh, every morning we'll start off with something like this, announcements um, for particularly that day. Uh, so I encourage you to come early. And if you have announcements, bring them to the registration desk so we can get them uh, identified. There's digital signage out there that's constantly going through. You'll see a lot of this information on that as well. Um, and of course, uh, we are in the last year We've had roughly 30 people leave and 30 people join. And so we are an evolving project uh, as we go. And just as a note, we have a couple of, uh, or not just a couple, several open positions. And we do better when we are the advocates and are the ambassadors out there and actually call the people that we know, our professional uh, associates and the, and the people we know in our fields, 
to actually get them engaged. And so um, even if you're not looking for a job with LSST, looking to see what we have open and helping us find the right people is, is, is really appreciated. And then next year, uh, the fourth, I guess I'll call it annual, I don't know that it's actually been exactly annual, but the fourth LSST at Europe meeting has, is already scheduled. We've done a few of these in some other, on other continents. This one in particular is already scheduled for our European colleagues. So mark your calendars for that opportunity to once again get engaged with uh, what the project is doing, in particular uh, advocating for science uh, in the future. Okay, 29 more minutes. Um, here's where we are. Besides all the cool pictures, which really do um, embody the project and the, and, the, and the progress that we've made, at this point in time, at the numbers, MREFC is the NSF side of the house. That project is 71% complete based on spending and completion of the work. The DOE side, the camera, they're 93% complete. They're really getting close to the end. This is exciting times. And what's particularly good about the progress that we've made is that everything we're still doing, everything we're completing, is according to the technical plan. We have not backed off on our science requirements. We are doing well. Our projected performance is exactly where we said we would be uh, when we started this six years ago. We do, however, continue to encounter problems. We have been dealing with them, whether they're technical, whether they're management. Uh, all of them have been dealt with to date. Um, and we continue to show uh, that we, as a project, are capable of, uh, of accomplishing what we set out to accomplish and to uh, deal with any of these issues that come up and emerge as, as we really challenge, as we, as we take on this very challenging project. And then, just to, be, just to put a finer point on it, um, some of those challenges are, are big and some of them are very specific. Uh, and, we just had a review, we've got another one in a few weeks. Here's the, here's the bullets, here's the bullet points that are very specific and I will be very upfront about that we're facing. Uh, we're down to three and a half months of schedule contingency on the, on the project. We have three more years to go and three and a half months to, to, uh, of, of, of unplanned time at this point. Uh, the telescope mount. Over the last year, we showed a really cool video last year, the telescope mount moving, everything was looking good. It's been a real struggle to get that out of the shop. We ran into some problems, we've encountered some technical issues, but we've gotten it going. It's finally on a boat on its way, uh, but that caused a significant schedule delay. In addition, sorry, um, we'll also talk a little bit about the dome. I mentioned 30 people have left. We've got constantly working with, uh, with uh, uh, the staff and transitions, and so that's something that we're dealing with constantly. Uh, roles, responsibilities as the, as the team uh, changes, uh, changes its shape and form. And then, of course, the, not just the, the schedule contingency levels, but also the cost contingency levels. These are the things that we're constantly working and having to work really hard to stay with. All right, just a couple of slides from each of the major subsystems. Um, again, I can't talk to all of this, and I don't plan to, but I hope you see a cool little picture and you, that drives you to go seek out somebody from, the, from that group. Um, but the big progress this last year is that every one of the sensors has been delivered to the camera team. Uh, half of those came, more than half came from right here in Tucson, uh, the other half from Great Britain. They are all in-house, and in fact, all of them have been put into rafts. Some of the rafts are being refurbished at the moment, but that was a huge accomplishment for the camera team and, and, and uh, Brookhaven in particular. Uh, the optics also, the, sh the, the image on the top right, uh, L1, L2, has been uh, completed, is also sitting here in Tucson, as it turns out getting packed up and get, is ready for shipment. If it's not already on a, a truck, looking for someone that'll nod that would know, but it's very close to being done and on its way to Slack for integration. And then the top right is just one of the images, that's the outside of the, of the auto changer um, for, or the manual filter changer for the camera. That all work is going on in Paris and I'm really happy to know that they've started work again and, and things are going well there. Um, but that hardware is also coming to completion. And so the real highlight I would say for camera is that they've not only been doing lots of testing with the real raft that we showed in the Krausstat last year, but now they've passed all that and as of today have three science rafts uh, loaded into the, into the camera and four of the uh, corner rafts. So that is just, that's the, that is our focal plane coming together. Uh, and so that's really uh, very exciting for that group. Data management continues 
to make really good progress on the basic structures of data management. Uh, this, the hardware is coming together, the algorithms are coming together, um, they are continually meeting their milestones, addressing the various stages of development, the incremental development that their, that their plan dictates, and they have really been pushing for, as each stage is complete, that they do full up testing, that they validate what they've done, and that they broadcast that. So the community can stay very engaged in the progress as we move forward. Uh, and that's not just software, but also with the hardware. I um, put a, mo no a note on there about the, um, the international linkage from Chile all the way up to NCSA. Uh, that is about to be completed. And by, the, by next year, I think we'll be at the full uh, 100 gigabit per second bandwidth. The real highlight is this work with science, the science platform. A few months ago, they had an outside review. The community was invited to come in and review the science platform. Uh, there's members of the DM team here to actually work with the community on the science platform so that you can get engaged, start to understand it, see how it's performing. But the point of this picture is to, rec to recognize that it is functioning. Uh, they are using this, uh, this, uh, this system to take data from Slack, move it to NCSA, process things. The work, the, the work is ongoing and right now is very focused on getting ready for early commissioning activities. Telescope and Sight has been extremely busy this year, uh, despite the issues that I mentioned about the dome and the telescope being problems. Um, the M1, M3 has been a huge success. Last year it was pieces and various parts uh, coming together, um, and this particular year they focused on assembling all of the pieces, putting the glass on it, testing it under the, under the interferometer at the mirror lab and getting uh, results that meet all of our requirements. Uh, since then, they've taken it apart and all the parts have been shipped. Uh, the middle picture on the top right is the M1, M3 glass trucking through Texas. Um, and I'm happy to say that everything we've shipped so far, whether it was the coating chamber viewed in the bottom middle or any of the telescope uh, or the M1, M3 glass and cell parts, all of it has fit through the tunnel. Um, you saw on the video a bunch of uh, trucks driving at night, uh, and I believe Chuck was, dry, was leading the way um, at, for one of those. But the getting through the tunnel and getting that much heavy equipment through the streets of Coquimbo and up through La Serena um, was uh, not a small task. And kudos to the whole team for uh, being able to get that organized, accomplished, and done safely. The highlight, uh, really, that exemplifies all of the progress of the summit at this point is to, is to show a picture of our secondary mirror, which is not just on site, but has been coated with its scientific perform, performing coating. That is a protected silver coating that was installed, or was deposited on our glass, on our summit, in our coating facility, in the, frankly, in the middle of a construction site. And so again, kudos to the team for being able to pull that off uh, and make that, uh, make that a really successful uh, uh, coding and something that now we don't have to do later, uh, which is what we're all about now, is saving schedule, is to do as many things as we can early, um, even if we don't need it for another year or so. EPO has been uh, working extremely hard uh, doing formal education uh, programs or formal education uh, units, as is depicted in, your, in, the, in the top left. Uh, they've been working with planetarium uh, video providers to make several of the assets necessary to put the uh, proper mediums uh, in place for, for engaging with our planetarium um, groups. And then, of course, the interaction with our, science, our, our uh, Spanish community through um, some of the people in Chile and just the engagement with all of our stakeholders and doing the assessments as necessary to see how all of the tools that the EPO program is putting in place really ha if, if it's effective in meeting its uh, objectives. System integration uh, and commissioning is something that you'll hear about in a plenary, I believe, on Thursday. Chuck will have a, a moment. Uh, but here, I just wanted to emphasize that last year we talked a lot about, well, we're, we're getting really close to starting commissioning. Commissioning has started. Uh, one of the images from the camera collage was a, a commissioning camera image, a pinhole camera image. That camera has been delivered to Tucson. It's shown there in the top, top left. Uh, that is ComCam hooked up uh, here in the lab in Tucson. It's getting ready to go to Chile in the next several months, about six months from now. 
Um, and so that's part of the com early commissioning, getting these tools ready, getting things connected. It's using, a, it's using equipment from the camera team. It's using things from the telescope team. It's expecting data to be transferred to the data management team. It's commissioning. Um, also in the top right, you see an image of the calibration system. Uh, that's the Oxtel uh, in the foreground and the LSST facility in the background. That also is one of the areas that we've been focusing on, trying to get that system in place. We don't necessarily need Oxtel soon, but it show, it's a great um, platform for us to be d doing some of the early commissioning. It's one of the things that we've highlighted in the past as something we didn't necessarily get prepared to do when it was here in Tucson. We missed that opportunity. We're trying not to miss the opportunity when it's in Chile already installed. A shout out to our safety team. Um, we have been able to do an incredible amount of work with hundreds of thousands of person hours on very dangerous construction sites doing um, one-off kinds of, of activities. And we've been doing it very safely. And it all comes from, uh, frankly, not just the safety team, but the entire project adhering to the culture, uh, having a good attitude, and really being cooperative. That is where it starts, and that is uh, the only way that we'll succeed on safety, is if everybody in the project understands that. And we can continue that, that, uh, that record. That's not to say that we haven't had lots of accidents. Um, thankfully, the majority, um, I think only three, had lost time accidents, but we want zero. And so we are continuing to work on trainings, on other ways to uh, make it clear to everybody what the dangers are around them and the kinds of activities they're doing uh, to make this even safer. Communications team has been very busy trying to keep up with all of the activities, uh, trying to make it clear to the whole community, to the whole project, of all the activities that we've been accomplishing. And so you see some of the things on the left um, as a list, just a sample of some of the activities that the communication team has been following. But on the right part of the column, I want to emphasize, and again, download these, this presentation, or you're going to take a picture of it, and uh, you're going to uh, just understand how many channels that we make available to the overall project and the community for information. And we're really trying to make that available to everybody. I hope you take, take part of that. So um, now for some of the changes and some of the, uh, some of the dip more difficult and the challenges that we're facing for a few slides here. Uh, since last year, we have had in our sort of the, the key leadership slide, um, I already mentioned about 30 people have come and gone onto the project, but on the org, overall org chart, uh, we did lose our systems engineering manager, Brian Selvey, last year. And, and I'm really happy that Chuck and Kevin Real and Austin Roberts stepped up to really take over uh, the work that needed to be done there. In the EPO group, uh, Ben Emmons left uh, late last year. And Amanda has really stepped up and learned all kinds of project management. Kathy Petrie stepped up to help her with some of those things. And Lauren, who just joined this year, is also helping her uh, as a deputy. And so that, that group is working very well uh, through those changes. And just recently, Bill Gressler, who was the project manager for Telescope and Sight, uh, stepped down. And Jeff Barr, who's also here somewhere, um, as well as Sandrine Thomas and Doug Neal, all stepped up and, to, and to, to take over different aspects of that job as we transform the leadership of the group from just a single telescope and site group that's focused on just telescope and site activities to recognizing that we're entering a new era of getting ready for uh, the, the system integration, the commissioning, and then into operations. So some of those roles and responsibilities have changed. And so thanks to Jeff, Sandrine, and Doug for for helping with that transition. The, I wanted to show this slide because I've already mentioned that our schedule is getting pressured. And one of the ways that we are dealing with the tardiness of the telescope mount and the dome is, in fact, to look at all the integration activities that were previously the focus of Telescope and Sight Group and folded them all into a single system integration test and commissioning activity. So from this day forward, we're looking at all of those things, everything we have to do from here to the end, and not so much focused on what's one subsystem or the other. And to do that, this is sort of a cartoon of, of the activities. And really what strikes most of us is just the parallelization of some of these things, how much stuff is happening in parallel. 
Here's just, I just wanted a, t a tickler for some of those activities, again, just to get people to be interested and to talk, and specifically talk to the, to the, the team working out the integration plans, is this particular image. This is ComCam on its integrating structure. If I show you the next slide, it sort of cuts through. But this is a lot of different parts. The yellow part is, a, is the cart that comes from the telescope mount vendor. The back end is the integration structure that goes on the top end of the telescope structure that comes from the TMA as well. The back of the cable wrap, the cable wrap shown on the, on the far left, that's the real cable wrap for the camera, also coming from the telescope vendor. In the middle is the refrigeration pathfinder coming from the camera team. Uh, and in the front is all the, the parts uh, and, and surrogate masses necessary uh, to demonstrate or to, to simulate a camera. Uh, and inside that, inside that volume is ComCam um, or one of the other test optics or t test uh, uh, systems. So this is just an example of something that we are no longer waiting for the end of the telescope mount to be done. The integration of this starts in October. To do all of this work and to have this many more people coming to the site and to be doing different kinds of activities than just the telescope and site work, we're also working with the team and really appreciate the work with the team that, to, to transform what they've been doing to something that we can invite the entire project into in organizing the work on the summit. This is key, especially because there's so many different kinds of activities. And I don't, I'm not going to talk to this box, but those of you that work the summit work, the activities have seen this or will soon see this because this is an emerging change to the way that we're organizing and, and strategizing about work, but also proving work and, and coming up with the priorities. Another part of that is to have a way to communicate that with ourselves and to deal with this every single day. And so there's a new JIRA program and a new JIRA process to really be able to take the, 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 the thoughts of strategy all the way down to the daily safety and coordination meeting. So two of the parts of the project that I mentioned that are a challenge and want to highlight um, here with a couple of slides is the telescope mount. Last year, you can see them the, on the far left, this was the telescope completely in, integrated, uh, functioning in the lab, in the shop in Spain. Uh, we had p pictures of it rotating. Uh, everything was looking good. Uh, we did face technical challenge, challenges. At the time, it delayed the actual f uh, factory testing. Uh, we came through many of those problems. We got through those, we resolved them. Some of them remained. We had to make the difficult decision to actually disassemble anyway. Otherwise, we would be, still be waiting for the telescope to be put on a boat. Um, that prayed off because the, so those problems with software and control did get solved. And we're happy to say everything that we currently expect uh, the, the, the TMA to be completely compliant with all of its requirements. Uh, but some of them are not yet tested. Some of those things were things we expected to test in the shop, uh, we're not able to. In addition, it turned out that disassembling 300 tons of steel uh, took a little longer, takes a little more space, and the, and the vendor was not as prepared for that. Uh, that did cause schedule. This might seem like a detail. If you're working on software, why do you care? This is what caused the entire project to be late by, by, by several months. Um, and in fact, it would have been many more months if it hadn't been for the restructuring of, this, of uh, our plans going forward. The dome is also, it's slowly continuing. Um, it's going so slow, that's how we spell it. Uh, <clears throat> you see this from last year, um, the, the completion in, in, in 2018. In 2019, it looks a lot denser, but it doesn't have panels on it yet. And so this has been a struggle. Uh, this is something that the site team is working in, in very difficult circumstances because we have a fixed price contract for that dome, and yet they're not completing what we need them to complete. And so we need to help them in many ways that we never planned uh, so that we get a dome that we need. And so this is just, again, just want to emphasize for you that these are some of the kinds of problems that we're facing and addressing. Um, and they exist across the project in, in multiple forms that sometimes never get the light of day because this team is well equipped and deals with them as they come. Sometimes it percolates up to this level where it's causing project-wide issues. Many times I'm really happy to hear about the problem after it's already been solved um, and we're already moving forward. 
uh, but it happens and it exists across the board. The schedule at this point looks like this in its sort of cartoon color format. Uh, it looks a lot like what it's looked like for the last several years, except for that little yellowish box or round circle in the bottom right now only says 3.5. And that's the three and a half months of schedule contingency that we have for our current expected finish to the time that we're going to hand this thing over for operations to start with the science survey. So overall, as a summary, the technical progress is excellent. I've already mentioned that we've seen lots of pictures, lots of, lots of uh, good progress going on. The performance predictions um, are consistent with what we've said. We have not given up on any of our technical performance. And for this stage of the project, that's pretty awesome. We continue to evolve, whether it's tools, I've mentioned some of them, whether it's teaming, whether it's roles, responsibilities, all of those things. Uh, are evolving constantly and we're trying really hard to stay in front of it and I really appreciate that everybody in this project is, is working together uh, to help solve those problems as they emerge. <clears throat> By the numbers, our earned value, and I spared all of you a single earned value chart, um, but they look okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that with those contingency levels at the, at, the, at the small numbers they are, that we aren't challenged and aren't having to work really hard to stay within our our overall budgets. So, um, and then the, the last comment is just 2020, the next year is key. I mean, we've got uh, so many things on uh, prepped to get, to get done and to be able to make some progress, um, but it does rely on a dome getting finished, an entire telescope being assembled, um, and lots of critical parts that have never seen each other coming together and for us to make them work, whether it's software, or hardware, or just hardware parts, all of those things are facing us and we'll see a lot in the next year. So, I left us seven minutes if you have any questions for uh, Steve or I, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Bob Blum. Seven minutes, oh, three minutes? Oh, sorry, I'm told I only have three minutes for you. If, if, you got a, if you have a question for three minutes, just shout it out. But if you really want to be heard, there are microphones. The, the 16 or 17 major parts. Oh, sorry. The, the question was, where is the TMA now? And it is spread out because it's coming in multiple containers. Many of those containers are already on the site. Uh, many of them are still coming. Uh, but the principal shipment that we call the TMA is 17 or 18, Michael will, will remind me. Um, it's the Canary Islands at this point. So it's on a ship and it's on its way. All right, I'll be here all week, but... Ready to go, great. Uh, so let me add my uh, welcome to that of Steve and Victor and say it's great to see everyone here. I think this is the first, uh, well this is the first uh, project community workshop that includes operations. We started operations uh, last October and I'll describe a little bit about that uh, as we go forward. But um, uh, thank you, that, that promises another at least 15 years of exciting stuff to go as we, as we go through these meetings and they'll just get more and more exciting as we continue. So I am Bob Blum, I am the Acting Director for Operations. This isn't really a, an outline, I'm just gonna cover these topics. What is operations? Uh, we'll talk about a new operations funding model and data rights model that many of you have heard about. No doubt some of you might have questions about that. And then uh, one of the specific activities that we're doing in pre-operations, which is a connection to the commissioning activity that's taking case on the project side. So the LSST survey is definitely, I would say, almost literally coming over the horizon, and that's why we have started operations. This is just the recent view of Cerro Pachon, and you see the telescopes there, SOAR, Gemini, and LSST on the right. 
And so we are getting really close now to ha having the science data that you all want to do the science we've been talking about for so long. LSST operations is a separate management team and a separate funding stream from the agencies and the project, but we are working very closely together, constantly uh, working this so that when we approach the time where the survey turns on, hopefully no one will notice there's any difference and we just smoothly keep taking data and the survey begins. That's the goal. So pre-operations actually began in October. Uh, LSST, or and SLAC had developed a 16-year proposal for the agencies that was submitted to both and approved by, well, not approved by both, but reviewed positively by both, I should say. Pre-operations is the specific phase of operations that's taking place now until the full survey starts in fiscal 2023. So October 1st, 2022 is still the date that we're, that we're moving to. Um, NSF has awarded or a three-year CSA for pre-operations. That's a cooperative support agreement. What that means is they saw an opportunity to do some of the funding for operations up front. So rather than go right into the full 16-year period, they have allocated us money to start the pre-operations activities for the next three years. And that's what we're operating under. DOE at the same time has fully committed to support uh, operations and the ramp into full operations as we go forward. Uh, we expect to have a joint operations review that will uh, review our plans for the operations team and the operations activities going through the full, full survey, and we expect to have that happen early next calendar year. The current uh, members of our team, myself and Phil, uh, Slack, uh, Phil Marshall at SLAC, uh, who's the deputy director, and Phil is somewhere here in the room, but I think probably most of you know him. Uh, we are. We are actually the two people who are basically full-time on operations right now, and everyone else that we're drawing from is, uh, has some role on the project, and they're committing uh, some fraction of their time to start working on operations while they continue to work most of their time on the project. And these, these are the people on this slide who are actively engaged with us to build the operations plan. So Will Omelin from uh, Science Operations, Michelle Butler at NCSA, uh, for the data facility, Amanda Bauer, who's the head of uh, the EPO uh, program, and Kathy Petrie and Christine Sodal, who are uh, ORA and SLAC uh, program coordinators working with us on the plan. In uh, the next fiscal year, we expect to start growing more people working with us, and you will recognize these names as well, uh, Chuck Claver, John Swinbank, Leanne Guy, Margaret Johnson, and various other people working on data management, uh, data pipelines, that kind of activity as well as administrative support. So this is just a preview for one aspect of our session tomorrow, which I hope you will come and, uh, and uh, participate uh, in with us, and that is the activity of actually serving data out of the commissioning period to the community. So the idea that we'll express more in detail tomorrow is that the commissioning team, which is part of the construction project, will be taking data during commissioning, and they'll be processing data and validating data that they think is useful for others to look at. And it will be the responsibility of the, of the uh, pre-operations team to serve that data to you all and work with you to support your needs during that period, just like we would in full operations, and uh, get your feedback. And so that's for us, it's for the pre-operations team, it's like a rehearsal for all of that. And, but also doing the, the um, the useful thing of, of giving you access to the data during commissioning. So I want to talk a little bit about the current funding model. In May, NSF and DOE uh, announced a new funding model for LSST operations. And uh, these are kind of, this is taken out of a memo that they uh, made public at that time. And the main points were that they reached an agreement of how they wanted to go forward that they wanted to acknowledge the value of international partnerships in LSST operations, and that they were working at that time to revise the partnership model to focus on in-kind contributions rather than monetary contributions. And indeed, that's what's happened in the meantime. And you'll see the rest of the talk here, and then tomorrow we'll be talking more about how, that, uh, how that's been fleshed out, at least to the extent that, that we've uh, done up to this point. 
Uh, the original model sought 25% of the operations fund from international contributors, but the sufficient funding hadn't been found and the agencies decided to move into a different direction. Uh, in, in order to ensure uh, the planning could continue, this new model for data rights and operations funding uh, would be developed by NSF and DOE, and it would ensure full support for the operations, that is, full support of the plan as we submitted it in 2017. And then these five specific bullets were written down in the memo, and you can, uh, you can download the talk later if you want and, and look at these if you haven't seen them before. But the basic uh, points were the following, that the data would be proprietary just as it was in the original funding model uh, for two years. The agencies also had no plans to de-scope the LSST operations at this point, so they will fully support the operations plan, as I said. Following agency approval, the project team will publish a data rights and data access policy for LSST. I'll say a bit about my, that uh, before the end of the talk here this morning. International participants may enjoy the same data access rights as U.S. scientists in exchange for in-kind contributions to LSST construction, facility operations, or related astrophysical resources as considered and agreed to jointly by NSF and DOE. I'll talk a bit more about that in just a second as well. And finally, there will be a resource board in operations that constantly reviews how the resources of LSST operations are doing and what is needed. This is not the board that will approve in-kind contributions to operations. Just want to make that clear. This board will help manage operations going forward. And it, and it will be run by NSF and DOE. Just to be very clear on points of contact for our our international partners going forward. NSF and DOE have directed ORA and SLAC to work directly with potential international participants. In this focus, ORA and SLAC will work directly within potential participants who have previously engaged uh, through a planned monetary contribution. These in, in colloquial parlance are the MOA holders with LSSTC. ORA and SLAC will work with the potential participants in, uh, to prepare in-kind contributions. Basically what this is saying is Phil Marshall and I will work with you to plan out how this goes and these contributions will be approved and reviewed by NSF and DOE. Implementing the in-kind uh, in -kind partnerships. The final consideration of approval of in-kind agreements will be by NSF and DOE. Just want to make that absolutely clear. If you don't take anything else away from the in-kind uh, discussion, it's that NSF and DOE will make the final judgment whether to accept uh, any particular in-kind contribution of any kind for LSST operations. The part, there will be partnerships for in-kind offsets to LSST operations directly. Now I'm talking about scope in the, in the proposal of activity to do for operations. And these will not be select, solicited broadly. Rather, the LSST operations team will work with international partners who we think could do part of the operations scope, if that seems likely, and we'll try and, we'll try and work something out directly. But we will solicit in-kind contributions generally from international participants that would enhance LSST operations and science. These, uh, these in-kind contributions could be other resources like telescope time or uh, data sets that are of interest to the U.S. community. And they would add value via contributions that have, have been de deemed to have this scientific value for the U.S. beyond the basic operation of the LSST facility. That is, we're talking about things that everyone would agree enhances the scientific impact and output of LSST, but it's not figured directly into our operations plan. Uh, in terms of, if you think of the data products, the level one, level two, uh, sorry, prompt data products, um, annual data release products, and the uh, user-generated products. We're talking about things that really enhance the ability of you to do science with LSST in that third level, uh, as well as things like telescope time and access to other surveys that might be proprietary but that are of great interest to the U.S. community. And we will solicit letters of intent uh, for these uh, contributions. Um, the specific types of added value in-kind contributions that I was just describing will be assessed by some process that's run by LSST itself 
but obviously it has to be agreed to by OR and SLAC as our, as our managing organizations and ultimately, of course, by NSF and DOE. New agreements will be made with international partners for improved in-kinds, and NSF and DOE will determine if the agreements could be de delegated directly to OR and SLAC or if there has to be an agreement at the agency level. That's all to be worked out in the future. And I, then I will say, as in the memo that NSF and DOE put out in May, they will prioritize in-kind contributions in the following order, the highest being offsets to actual operations costs, then other resources like data sets and telescope time, and finally added value. But all three are in the mix. We will be talking to you about all three. Uh, NSF and DOE have, improved, have approved this basic implement, implementation plan that I'm, that I'm talking about today. Okay, just a few words about the MOA holders, because Phil and I are already fielding a lot of questions from a number of you. What was said in May, and is true now, is that the uh, people with memoranda of agreement with LSSTC, uh, the MOA holders, um, people that had an MOA at that time, will be considered to, have, to continue to have rights that are specified in that MOA as far as participating in the project, participating in science collaborations through June of 2021. So that means basically the idea is that we have two years to get these all figured out and move the international participants into new agreements. If you are an international partner with an MOA right now, and you had it in May, we will solicit in-kind contributions from you, even if you need to change your MOA or end your MOA with LSSTC before you have a new agreement with us. Finally, unsolicited proposals, that is, proposals from people who don't have MOAs, will be welcome. We obviously want to do anything that makes sense for LSST operations if the value is there. Uh, and in some cases, we may target them for specific things we're thinking about to groups that haven't uh, committed to an MOA up to this point. Thanks. Uh, so a proposed timeline and everything subject to modification. We've already been having some co initial conversations with certain partners about larger possible offsets to operations. We've had many conversations with many of you about the status of how we're going forward, and we will continue to do that. Um, uh, we will solicit, we think, LOIs, letters of interest for possible income contributions by the end of October. That's our goal. And we would expect to take uh, such uh, um, uh, letters of interest in, uh, up through March of 2020. From now until then, we'll be working on setting up the process of how we will vet these and get the approval of, of SLAC, ORA, NSF, and DOE. And we'll be communicating that with you as we go along, of course. And that includes you know, all the offsets uh, um, to operations, other resources, and added value. And finally, other resources and added value vetting process will be run directly by uh, LSST and we're discussing uh, how we can get the Science Advisory Committee and the science collaborations involved in that process. So you'll hear more about that as we go uh, forward. And we, we hope to, well, we hope, we will get all this finished by June 2021. Okay, just uh, I think one more slide here, uh, just um, about data rights, because that is a, a topic that's connected to this and is on many people's mind. We have evolved the data rights policy for this new model. We're almost uh, finished with that. I can tell you for certain that we'll be handing kind of a finished version of this to, to NSF and DOE uh, as they asked for in the May memo uh, soon, and like tomorrow. And um, we expect to, to work with them quickly to make this a public document so you all can see what we're talking about. Many of you contributed to a data rights policy document last year, about this time. I can say that this document is evolved from that one, and I would, say, I would describe it as saying it's more liberal in how it approaches your ability to collaborate and do science. So I think it should be uh, something that's A, not surprising to you, and B, hopefully uh, welcome by you, but you'll see it soon. Uh, and we will put this document under change control for operations, and we have three years. If something does come up that people think it really needs to be addressed, we'll, we'll certainly be able uh, to do that, so don't worry. 
Okay, and then just uh, to end then, uh, this uh, nice slide that Victor showed as well from the eclipse uh, from last month, uh, but I just want to invite you all to our session tomorrow morning at 11 in the Presidio 3-4, and we will talk more about these topics, take your questions, but we'll also talk about uh, the release of data during the commissioning period and, and what you think your needs and desires are for that. Um, and I've broken it down here. We'll probably try and limit the discussion on data rights and funding model to about 30 minutes uh, and then take the rest of the time to talk about the commissioning period and especially to get your input on that. So with that, I will stop and maybe we have a couple minutes for a question or two. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, look, uh, I'll be around all week. You can you can grab me privately if you want to talk, and we'll be uh, we'll be in Presidio three four tomorrow at eleven. Sorry. Oh, uh, it, Pat Burkett is going to introduce our uh, undergraduate research speakers. Something that I'm sure will be much more fun and exciting. <laughs> now for something completely Thanks. different. <laughs> so come, you can come ahead. Up, uh, yeah. just, just go ahead to the all the way to the far side. Just like, I think you can see. Assembling. Are we ready? Okay. So my name is Pat Burkett, and I'm on the faculty at Stanford University, and uh, a member of the executive board of the LSST Corporation. And one of the things that we've had the pleasure of funding is uh, the student um, undergraduate intern, uh, undergraduate researchers program. And for those of you who were here last year. Uh, we had about 19 students attend. Uh, this year we have uh, 24, I think the number was. And this program was organized um, with Lyndon Hickey, who is probably outside at this point. And she's been instrumental in uh, pulling all this off, and also the travel uh, uh, people here. So we have uh, 20, roughly 24 students here. And what we're going to do is uh, they practice this morning to do 30 second pitches uh, for their posters. And their posters are outside. So take note as to the ones that you will want to see, because you'll only have an hour to visit their posters. And there are a lot of them. So let's go ahead and get started. Praveen. Hello. My name is Praveen Balaji. I'm a student at the University of Chicago with the LSST program at Fermilab. And my advisors are Alex Relisha Wagner and Brian Nord. And the research question I had was, can we use a neural network to detect and localize cell streams given a sky map? And so far, we've created a simulation to use as training data for the YOLO object detection network, and we have successfully trained it. Uh, we have yet to validate it. So if you want to learn more about stellar streams and YOLO, please come by my poster. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kalista and I'm a student at University of Chicago and this summer I worked at Fermilab with Brian Nord and our main research question was what combination of neural network models and hardware will be most efficient in classifying gravitational lensing images for LSST and so far we trained a ResNet 50 model on about 10,000 images and got about 70% accuracy and so in the future, we hope to run it on all the available data and also write code to access an FPGA. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hello, my name is Laurel Doyle. I'm a rising junior at Cornell, and this summer I've been at Slack working with my advisors Aaron Rudman and Adam Sm Snyder, and uh, I've been working uh, on looking at the astrometric shifts in the LSST CCDs caused by sensor effects. Uh, so far, we've been able to characterize these using projected patterns of sources, and we're looking into doing the same using flat field images. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elisa Tabor, and I study at Stanford University. I'm studying the exact same project as Laurel, so I'm gonna tell you more about the outcomes. Um, we succeeded in calculating the astrometric shifts caused by tree rings, as you can see in the flat field image where I overlaid my vector field of the astrometric shifts, and so far we've found no evidence the shifts caused by features we call coffee stains, which are in the left of the image. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin Hayes. I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania working with Masao Sako. This summer, my research has focused on improving how we look for microlensing events in DES data, which we have done using simulations. In these simulations, we test data cuts, which remove poorly fitted curves from our list of potential candidates. And our, data, our newest data cuts are able to return only those graphs with fitted parameters very close to the true parameters. So we're interested in, interested in learning more about these simulations or their application in real data. Come talk to me. Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Fortino. I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm working with Professor Gary Bernstein. My research question this summer was, can you model astrometric shifts in DES data with a Gaussian process regression model? What we found was that astrometric variance is reduced by a factor of five in initial testing. All right, got it right this time. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Bowen. I am a student researcher at Northwestern Sierra under Aaron Geller. And my project this summer was to try and find the period recovery rate of eclipsing binary stars with LSST, specifically in star clusters. Uh, so with our simulations, uh, we ran these for about 2,000 both open and globular clusters. And we were, about to, we were able to recover about 17% on the order of about 10,000 uh, eclipsing binaries in terms of the period. So if you'd like to learn more about eclipsing binaries, uh, come check out my poster. Thank you. Hi, all. I'm Ted Gross. I'm from Rice University. I work with Kevin Ryle at Slack. Um, on LSSD ComCam commissioning. This included both a little bit of unpacking and setting up ComCam here in Tucson for early testing, as well as using some early image data to um, identify amplifier um, gains, as well as uh, create a bad, bad pixel map, excuse me. Hello, I'm Anand. I worked with Brian Nord this summer um, using neural differential equations to perform regression and classification tasks. We, um, neural differential equations are essentially a way of parameterizing your, the, div, the derivative of the function that you'd like to learn with a neural network and then integrating on that to, at any point in time you'd like for your solution. This makes them prime targets for light curve prediction and classification. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Jaramillo. Uh, I'm from the University of Arizona. Um, I'm working at NOAO through the Time Step Internship Program. Um, my advisors are Connie Walker and Knut Olson. And my objective was to, uh, to adapt the Teen Astronomy Cafe Jupyter Notebooks uh, to make them usable in a classroom environment. And keeping that in mind, uh, we were able to get a, a few local Tucson uh, high school teachers and students to uh, approve of some of the notebooks uh, by implementing interactive widgets, a consistent styling, and um, that uh, classroom-specific provision. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Emmy. Um, I'm from Stanford University working at Slack this summer under Steve Kahn and David Thomas. I work on the active optic system with deals in mirror deformations. And a key to diagnosing the optical state for LSST is to wavefront estimate. And the way we do this is by forward modeling donut images. So in our forward model, it runs through iterations, fitting Zernike polynomials against a, a simulated donut image. And so if you'd like to stop by and talk to me about donuts, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jen Locke. I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania working under Masao Sako. The goal of our project is to implement an algorithm to sort different types of variable stars from non-variable objects in DES data using the LARMS goggle periodogram so that we can eventually build a statistical sample of all variable stars. We have found that the LARMS goggle periodogram can sufficiently detect the correct periods from simulated light curves with real MG data, but there is still a lot to be done with interpreting the results from real sources, which I will be talking about during the poster session. Thank you. I'm Shifra Mandel. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University working with Katherine Johnston. And our research concerns the question of how we can determine the merger histories of galaxies in the universe. We developed an algorithm that can efficiently measure the properties of tidal debris substructures that are found in galactic halos. This information can allow us to test theories of hierarchical galaxy formation in which satellite dwarf galaxies are cannibalized by their much more massive hosts. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jorge Morales. I'm from the University of Puerto Rico at Maya West. I just graduated. I am working with Aaron Rudman, uh, Eric Charles, and Seth Deagle. During this summer, we have been trying to find a function that can correct the nonlinearities found in the LSST, CCD prediction readout electronics. And we have been trying to identify possible sources of those nonlinearities. We did find a function, and we did find a source. So if you are interested in that, come and shout me in my poster presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Nybauer. I'm an undergraduate at Penn, and uh, my work involves a somewhat unique approach to constraining key properties of circumstellar debris disks. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, debris disks are dust-dominated disks. They're relatively cool and found around many stars. Um, we explore the possibility of measuring debris disks through their uh, submillimeter emission. What makes the project so unique is that we do all of this using CMB surveys. So in particular, we use Planck 545 and 857 gigahertz all-sky maps. And we actually find a detection at over five sigma. And very excitingly, we find that our measurements around stars with known verified debris disks match measurements from other surveys well within one sigma. Thank you. Hi, I'm Swathi, and this summer I worked with Melissa Ness from Columbia University and CCA. We were modeling galaxies from the Manga data set, and we wanted to use um, near field Milky Way stars to do this. So our preliminary models have already allowed us to recreate some of the key spectral features, but if you want to know what's coming next or learn about what exactly we can use with these high fidelity models, be sure to come by and stop by my poster. Hi everyone, my name is Marwa Rusi at the University of Chicago, studying, uh, working with Dr. Brian Nord at Fermilab. Um, our project was to uh, build a semi-supervised -super learning approach to anomaly detection for the classification of gravitational lenses. Um, so we built a Siamese network that was able to extract specific feature embeddings for the input images, and we found an impressive uh, accuracy of about 99%, which is on par or even um, surpasses traditional methods. So if you'd like to discuss further results or future work, come see me at the poster session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is George Iskander. I'm a rising senior at Yale, working this summer at Stanford and Slack with Professor Aaron Rudman and fellow undergraduate Julian Rovi with the SREIP program to understand the following question. Will correlated read noise in the LST, LSST CCDs affect the galaxy two-point correlation function? And our methodology is as follows. First, we simulate, we simulate the correlated read noise in the CCDs using flat field and bias images. And second, we model the effect of read noise on observed galaxy flux. And third, we recalculate the two-point uh, two correlation function. And now, Julian Roby.
Hello, I'm Julian Rovi. Uh, I'm a rising sophomore at Stanford working under Pat Burkett and Aaron Rudman. George already introduced our research topic, so I'll talk a little more about our outcomes. Uh, we've been able to successfully model the read noise, and we've also been able to successfully model the effect of that read noise on our galaxy flux. We still need to work on recalculating the two-point correlation function using the, the affected galaxy fluxes, but we are working on that right now. Good afternoon, my name is Catherine Simotis and I'm a, I a student at Stanford University working with Risa Weschler and Chen Hao To on the question, how can we quantify the impact of projection effects and orientation bias on optically selected cluster samples? So our outcomes are that we're currently investigating projections impact on line of sight velocity and number density profiles using simulations and that is for the purpose of creating a map to directly map those profiles onto the projection effects and triaxiality. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jake Stanton and I'm from Brown U University, but I'm studying at Stanford this summer under Professor Risa, Risa Weschler. Um, and our project is to try to emulate the void galaxy cross-correlation function using Gaussian, Gaussian processes on simulated cold dark matter uh, uh, and body simulations. And so already we've created the emulator and we're working on testing its accuracy right now. And next steps involve updating it to use a more complicated uh, HOD. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Luke Serber. I'm a student at the University of Washington. Uh, for the past few summer, for the past few months, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Uh, Siegfried Egel and Mario Yurik, I've been exploring the potential uh, benefits of simultaneous observations between Euclid and the LSST. Um, I found there to be uh, 7,200 intersecting pointings. Out of those pointings, I uh, used Astro Query to find about 240,000 objects that are both visible and accessible by astrometric triangulation. Um, from those objects, you can find the distance. Uh, with multiple observations, you can get the orbit. And with the help of Euclid, you can get the classification. Uh, come stop by my poster if you're interested. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ring Chung Zhang. I'm from University of Chicago. For the summer, I work at Fermilab with my advisor, Brian Nord. Our research question is, can we train a neural network for image, astronomical image denoising without any um, ground truth of the signal or without having any estimation of the noise? Well, yes, we can. With self-supervision, our deep learning algorithm de uh, demonstrates potential in image denoising. If you want to question the reliability of our neural networks or just want to see some bad results, come to my poster. Thank you. Okay, so this morning uh, I told the students that the LSST is being built for their generation and that uh, they represent, you know, who's going to use this data because many of us will be retired. So, uh, so I think, th is this the end of the session then? Great. Okay, so we will give a chance for the students to just grab their stuff and make their way to the poster. The poster's out in the corridor and then please go join them. Thank you.